In the previous session, we walked through how to build a marketplace page, and now we're going to add more functionality and introduce one of Bubble's most powerful logic features, backend workflows. I'm excited to introduce our instructors, Maria Poza and John Carter, who are both Bubble developers on the team that builds Bubble.io. John, would you like to say a few words about the class you and Maria are teaching today? Absolutely. Thank you, Nicole. So in our class, we're going to allow the admins of the shop to be able to send out bulk emails to uh, users who are interested in, in staying up to date, uh, you know, be notified of maybe new products or discounts to those products. And what we want to be able to do is to allow them to do that in mass. And then also, we want to build the functionality for these end users to express that interest and follow the shop. So our lesson is going to be broken out into two parts. I will introduce the necessary changes to our database to allow the users to express this interest. And then Maria is going to take those records and with a backend workflow, uh, schedule that email and allow the admin to send out those notifications to everyone who has uh, followed that shop and expressed that interest. So by the end of this lesson, you'll be able to set up backend workflows in your application. Um, also schedule them for some point in the future and also cancel them if you need to cancel them and intervene at any time. Um, do keep in mind, if you have any questions, definitely pop those in, into the chat as we go and let's get started. Hey everyone, we are going to build off of the previous video and add a follow functionality to our SaaS application. Um, in this case, this functionality is going to allow uh, not only the user to be able to keep track of things that they're interested in, but also allow the admins, the owners of these shops to get in touch with those uh, users who are following their shops, send them notices. So let's take a quick moment and switch over to the data type tab and look uh, at how we can support this functionality. So what I want to do first is start off by creating a new data type called follow. And what I want to do is I want to log the two things that are being interacted with that we want to you know, merge together and record when this occurs, this interaction. So the case here is we want to track the shop in question. So this will be a shop data type. And then we also want to track the user. So the user who initiated the follow, that way we can also uh, let the user know which shops they have followed over time. So we have this record. I also want to go ahead and add this to the user shops I'm following. So shops I'm following, we are going to make this a list of that same data type. There's just one more data type we need for this functionality, and that is the email data type. So I'm going to walk you through setting up that data type. And then in the last half of this uh, session, Maria is going to spend a little bit more time on this data type and also make some other adjustments to this as well, too. And the main thing that we need here is the relationship to the shop and the user, and then the corresponding text and date fields just to indicate the subject line, body, and when the email should be sent. Great, and now that we have all that set up, we're ready to get back to building. So what I wanna do is I wanna add a workflow to when we click on the icon to indicate that we want to make this change. And then I'm gonna show the pop-up and then display the product in question to that pop-up, okay? So let's go ahead and open up that same pop-up here, okay? So right now, this is tailored to just showing a message to the user that they can follow the shop. Let's look at the very first one. So button follow, we're gonna add a workflow to this. And the very first thing that we wanna do is create the new thing. So we are going to create our follow. We're going to establish our two connections to the user, current user, and then the shop. We can get to that by going to the parent group product and then the related seller shop of that product. Perfect. Now what we want to do is we want to make a change to the current user, and we want to update their list of shops that they are following, and we want to add the item that we just created. Now, the interesting thing about this is we can use the same pop-up to achieve not only the following of the shop, but also the unfollowing of the shop. So let's edit the workflow, and we're going to add that condition here to the workflow trigger itself. So we're going to say only when we're going to go to the current user shops that they're following. And we're going to look at each of those follow records and the shop that is saved to that record. So we're saying, okay, is the shop not contain doesn't contain the 
shop in question relating to the product that we're viewing in the pop-up. Okay, this whole expression is going to allow Bubble to definitively say, we don't currently follow this shop, so follow it. So now we wanna make the inverse of this. We're gonna take a quick shortcut. We're just gonna copy this endpoint. We're gonna paste, we're gonna make a duplicate. And because this is a, a yes or a no, we can just swap the doesn't contain with contains. We're already following the shop. So we're gonna swap up the actions. We're gonna say, delete the thing. And then we are gonna search for the following record that pertains to the user and the shop in question. So we can fill out our two search constraints that we know. We have the user, the user is just the current user. And then the shop is the parent group's product seller shop. So remember, whenever you're trying to delete a single thing or make a change to a single thing, you just need to end that search expression with the first item of that search. So if we found something from that list of follows pertaining to the user, we delete that follow, and then that's all we need to do. You could also go ahead and add in another action to say shops I'm following remove, but because uh, the way that Bubble handles deleting records and if those records uh, appear in list fields anywhere throughout your application, it's just gonna automatically remove that item from the list for you uh, without you having to do anything else. So the next thing I wanna do is change that UI. So the idea here is we wanna change the wording. Currently it shows the following messages. We wanna change that to, hey, if you already do follow, you want to unfollow. So that would be the, if that contains the parent group products shop. So we're actually gonna grab this condition. We're gonna copy that expression by right clicking. And we can, so we already have an example here. So uh, we'll go ahead and just paste over this, replace it with our new expression. So if the current users shops that I'm following, each item shops contains the parent group products seller shop, then change the text. So we're saying unfollow now. We can do the exact same thing, copy the exact same expression, add in a new condition for the heading of this. If you get an error like this, it likely is due to the group not having a proper data source. So let's just go ahead and update this. This needs to be a data type product, parent group's product. As soon as we do that, go to the condition, everything is blue. It knows the product in question to refer to. We can change the text. So now we can say unfollow shop. Here we go. Do the exact same thing for the text here. We're not, we're not gonna cover that. Um, we'll keep moving on. But the idea now is that we can change the behavior and the wording of that pop-up to you know, properly re reflect what's going on. The other alternative, and I'll just voice this over really quick, is you could just create another pop-up, one that is for following and one that is for unfollowing. And then based on those same conditions that we were just looking at a moment ago, you can apply that to actually clicking on the button and then route the user to whichever pop-up is relevant to that situation, okay? The final thing here is we're going to also look at a uh, like an updated version of that condition so that way we can change the heart to indicate that we are following. Let's add another condition. And if this is true, let's change the heart icon to uh, a filled in heart just to indicate that this has already been captured. Okay, so we have covered the data structure for this functionality. And we've also talked about interacting with a product, finding the shop in question relating to that product, and creating the follow record to merge those two individuals together. We also covered taking that record and saving it to the user. So we're gonna pause here on the user facing side and we're gonna switch gears over to the admin side. Now that we're on the shop admin page, let's talk about what we are going to use this page for and ultimately how can we set up the overall structure to support that. Now we want the shop admin to be able to, to see those followers and schedule those emails to go out. So what we're gonna do is we're going to create a typical dashboard layout on the left-hand side. We have our dashboard and then the rest of the page is going to be the content. So for this example, we are just going to make a few link options on the left-hand side, make our table of all of our uh, soon to be scheduled emails, and then an option for the admin to go in there and hit send. Okay.
Okay, so we have our layout now. We have our left-hand side dashboard with link options. And over the right-hand side, we have our, uh, our heading just to let us know what section we're in, as well as our button to send all these emails. And then the final thing that I want to discuss before I hand it over to Maria is setting up the data source for this table. So this will be all of the individual records that we have uh, that more or less indicates these are the uh, scheduled emails that are going to go out. So the data source of this really quick is we are going to um, set up a search for these emails and then now update our search to say shop is equal to the current user's shop. There we go. And now we're ready to move on to the next functionality and actually sending these emails to all of the followers of a particular shop. Okay, now that John has set up the basic structure of the admin page, let's talk about scheduling emails and how that relates to backend workflows. So one of the main benefits to backend workflows is that you can schedule them for the future and then cancel them if they haven't yet run. And so let's start off with creating some basic creation and deletion functionality like we would with any other data type, uh, in this case for our emails. So I'll build out a couple pop-ups here and the associated logic to create and, and delete the email records. Okay, so we've created the pop-ups. Now let's hook up the logic to create and delete. First of all, when a user clicks send emails, let's reset the pop-up and then show it. Once the user has filled out all those fields and clicked this button, let's go ahead and create the email record. and then go ahead and close the pop-up. Similar thing with canceling the email. However, this pop-up needs to know which email we're gonna cancel. So let's give it a data source of an email or type of content email. We can leave the data source empty because when a user clicks the delete icon, we are going to display the data into the pop-up and then show it as well. And then when the user clicks to cancel it, let's go ahead and delete the parent group's email and hide the pop-up. So now that we've set up our creation and deletion of the email record, let's talk about backend workflows. In order to access backend workflows, the first thing you need to do is upgrade your app's plan. So I'll go ahead and do that to put it on the starter plan. Then if you go to the API tab, all you need to do is check off this box to enable backend workflows, which will expose this backend workflow option here. So in order to facilitate the scheduling and sending of emails, we're gonna need two different endpoints. The first one is designed to schedule the second one to run at a future date and time. So let's go ahead and create those workflows. We'll call the first one schedule email. This one will need to take in just an email record, which is what you just created via your pop-up. The second one we'll call send the email. And same thing with the email parameter. The email record is really what stores all of the useful information. So in terms of scheduled email, really all you need to do for this one is to schedule an API workflow. We're going to schedule the other one, so send email, for the future date and time that you have specified, that your admin has specified. So we can find that date and time by using the emails, send date. And the email that you want to send through is simply the email that was sent to this workflow. So you can pass the email right through. The way that Bubble works is when you schedule an API workflow for the future, there's always a unique ID associated with that workflow run. And so when it comes time to deleting the or canceling an upcoming email, we need to be able to access that ID. 
So what we'll do to facilitate that is create a new field on the email called workflow ID of type text. And as part of this scheduling workflow, we are going to add that to the email. So we can say result of step one, and that will spit out the ID. Now within the send email action, what we wanna do here is use the send email action to uh, send the email. Uh, let's say we want to send it to the shop admin and then BCC all of the shop followers. So we can say current users email because we know the shop admin is the one who's kicking off all these workflows. And in order to find the followers of the shop at the time when the email is sent, we're going to go do a search for the follows related to that shop. And the shop can be found also on the email. So now we have a list of follows. We need to get from follows to email addresses. So we'll say follows, we'll take each follows user, and we'll take each user's email address. Now the rest of this is pretty simple. We'll take the subject and body stored on the email and call it a day. Okay, let's go back to our admin page to the schedule email and make sure that we're actually running these workflows. So we'll insert an action here and we'll say schedule an API workflow. The one we want to schedule is the schedule email. We're going to do it right here and now, current date and time. And we're going to send it the email that was created in step one here. So just to recap, we have created an endpoint that will schedule another endpoint which is the one that will actually send the email. And this is all kicked off from this button here. Now let's talk about cancellation. I'm gonna create a new endpoint called cancel email. And again, like the others, it's just gonna take in an email parameter. And what this is gonna do is use the cancel a scheduled API workflow action. And we're gonna take that handy workflow ID that we stored when we originally scheduled this. So we can cancel the scheduled API workflow and just take the workflow ID. And in this case, we probably want the record to disappear from the admin's repeating group. So let's go ahead and delete the email record as well. And then like we did before, let's go back to our admin page and make sure we are actually scheduling this. So from the cancel email button, let's go ahead and schedule an API workflow, which is cancel email, We'll do it right now, and we'll take parent group's email. Now, I just realized that I had already put this delete email step here, so we can go ahead and get rid of that because that deletion is going to happen within this workflow instead. So let's go ahead and test this out and see what's happening behind the scenes. I'm going to start by creating two users that we can run with, one for an admin and one for just a regular user who is following a shop. Okay, so let's go to the search page and run as the follower so that we can test the following functionality. So on this page, I want to make sure that the user is following border radius. So I'll click this heart and confirm. So now in our database, we can see there's one follow for that shop for that user, which is what we'd expect to see. Now let's go back to our admin page and run as the admin user so that we can test setting up an email. We'll schedule it for, let's say, Friday at 5 p.m. So scheduling this not only created the email record, which we can see here in the repeating group, but it also should have scheduled the send for Friday at 5 p.m. So the way we can verify that is, first of all, let's just make sure that the email record is here, which it is. And then if we go to logs, scheduler, and hit show, we can see there's one workflow scheduled for Friday at 5 p.m., the user was this admin user. And then we can also see the ID here is 19. And then if we go back to the database, we can see that the workflow ID of 19 was also saved there. So that's great. Now let's test out canceling. So when we cancel an email, we would expect the email record to be deleted and that workflow to disappear from the scheduler. So let's see what happens. So the email record is gone. If we go back to the scheduler and hit show again, it's gone, which is great. So let's test out um, actually allowing the email to be sent. 
and I will schedule it for, let me actually make a quick update so that I can get this down to every one minute so we don't have to wait too long. I can always change it back to 30 minutes afterwards. Schedule for today at, let's do 6.12 p.m. And then we'll see if it works. Okay, great. So in my inbox, I can see that I received the email with the right subject and body. And I can see that it was sent to the admin and BCC'd the follower as expected. So here you have it. This is functionality to schedule and cancel workloads, such as sending emails, just like a shop admin might in a marketplace app in order to stay in touch with our customers. To get the ball rolling, I'd like to pose a question. The scheduled email notifications in this app were built using backend workflows. What's the difference between a front end and back end workflow? I can take that one first. Um, there are a handful of differences. I'll call out just a few of them. The biggest one I would say is that back end workflows run on the server, whereas front end workflows run on the client, which means like the computer that your user is using. And so some implications are back end workflows are asynchronous. So you can't always guarantee that they'll be done by a certain time uh, versus front end workflows can be synchronous and you can kind of guarantee work, work workflow order. Um, and then last thing to mention is that front end workflows require a user to be on a page. And so if your user closes the page in the middle of a workflow, it'll stop running versus back end workflows will continue executing. Awesome. Thanks for clarifying the difference. Um, I think when a user's new to Bubble, they are getting introduced to a lot of new terminology. So I'm seeing a question in the chat about the term endpoint. You say that term multiple times throughout the video. Could you explain what an endpoint is? I'll take this one. So we use endpoints and backend workflow, API workflow fairly interchangeably. So all this is describing is one of those API workflows that you want to uh, set up in your application and call from a variety of places. So like the uh, API workflow that Maria set up at the end of her video to send out these emails, that is an endpoint. Awesome, thank you. I'm also seeing a question about scheduling backend workflows. How do you decide when to add in delays as it is going through these like iterative loops in a backend workflow? Yeah, I would say if you are going to run a backend workflow on a really big list of things, it's generally a good idea to space them out so you're not sort of overwhelming your app and risking kind of users seeing the implications of that on the front end. Um, you could also consider running recursive workflows if you are trying to cycle through a very large list of things over a longer period of time. Uh, but it's just generally like a, a safety mechanism that you can use um, when trying to modify a bunch of data at once. Fantastic. Um, could you provide some examples of good use cases for when to use backend workflows? Yeah. Sure. I'll take Go this one, Maria. Yeah. So uh, we have a couple of examples. And uh, for some of these, like think of when your users are creating data in your application. And if you don't want to hold on to that data for a very long time, and you want to you know, clean up that data and remove it after a certain amount of time, say a retention policy that you want to put into place, you can set up a backend workflow to, as soon as that record is created, schedule for 365 days in advance or whatever that uh, retention policy window is that you want to set to remove that. So that's just one example. Another example, you can think about email marketing campaigns. So after a user has signed up to your application, you can schedule a number of um, and, and any amount of time between any of those uh, those steps, emails to go out to that user to you know welcome them to the platform, remind them of you know certain features within the application um, and whatever else you want to do. Um, and really, uh, I think one of the other like final good examples of this is any kind of recurring logic that you want to put into your application. So just um, you know recurring payouts, for instance, if you want something to happen on a set basis, uh, scheduling a back and workflow can, can definitely help with that. 
Amazing. In this lesson, you both showed us how to schedule and cancel emails. I'm seeing a question in the chat about supporting the sending of SMS messages. Is that possible through Bubble? Can you integrate with a third-party service like Twilio? Absolutely. Yeah, there should be um, plugins on the marketplace to help with this. Um, otherwise, you could use the API connector to hook up to Twilio. Absolutely. Definitely possible. Cool. Um, how do you decide when to use a one-to-one -one database relationship versus one-to-many? Yeah, I could take this one. Um, Alan touched on it in his session, but just to put it into the context of our app, um, generally you want to stay away from having a field that stores a really big list of things. Um, so in the context of the Marketplace app, you could imagine storing the list of users following a shop, or you could store the, the shops that a user is following. Um, the former could grow pretty large pretty quickly if you have thousands or tens of thousands of users all following the same shop. That field is at risk of getting too big. Um, the other one is a little bit safer, which is why we went with that in our video, uh, because it would require one person to follow thousands or tens of thousands of shops, which is pretty unlikely. Um, so there are pros and cons. Uh, in our video, you'll, you'll notice that we used one of these list fields and also a separate table to relate a user to a shop. Um, so that's sort of like a third option to consider. Um, it's, it's a matter of, of the context of your app, making certain decisions based on what you'll need to show in your design, and ultimately something that you can practice and get better at over time. Um, Alan mentioned this in his video too, but we do have some resources with uh, sample database structures, which should help get you started. Awesome. So as users are starting to build out workflows, whether that's on the front end or the back end, I think a common question is how to go about debugging those workflows in Bubble. So curious if you both have advice on how to go about debugging. I can take this one. So when we think about debugging in Bubble, there's two main approaches for this. And uh, we've used these terms already in this lesson, and that's the, the front end side of Bubble and the back end side of Bubble. And debugging is done differently for each of those two scenarios. If you're on the front end, we have a tool called the debugger. And you can use that while you are running workflows to you know, test and verify that the uh, results that you would expect to be uh, coming through are actually coming through. It's a fantastic tool. If you uh, have not used it before, definitely take a look at our manual for some instructions on how to use that. And then as far as backend workflows go, that is where you cannot use that same tool, but there still are ways to, to debug that. And you can use server logs. Um, that is a feature that we have in the settings tab of, uh, of your Bubble application to give you a good sense of which actions ran in these backend workflows. If any conditions prevented any of those actions from running, you can see that in the server logs as well too. And then one other thing that I really like to use, it's not technically a feature of Bubble, but you just decide when you want to implement this for uh, additional debugging is in these workflows, if you are just working on building them for the first time and uh, something's not quite working correctly at a certain step in that workflow, uh, you can insert an action in there to uh, log a record in your database or send yourself an email to notify you of this is what those results are at this step to give you a better sense of what might be going wrong. But generally, you'd use your server logs to be able to um, you know, further debug those back in workflows. Awesome, super helpful advice, especially those who are just getting started. So I'm seeing another question about search performance and whether or not it's possible to index the database. Um, I think more generally, do you want to just address the question of how to go about improving search performance? I think that's something that users are often curious about, especially when they have a really large data source that they're searching through. Yeah, definitely. Um, Bubble does create indexes, indices behind the scenes. Um, as far as I know, there's no way to create one manually, but for example, if if your app notices that you're trying to search your database for a specific field and there isn't an index created for it already, Bubble should create one for you. Um, in terms of scalability, it's a huge topic to consider and, and it often comes down to the design of your database. And so sometimes that will require adding a field to a data type in order to be able to search directly on that field. 
rather than having to search a linked data types field um, in a repeating group, for example. Um, but yeah, ultimately it, it, it does come down to what you're trying to build. Um, and there are a handful of best practices to follow. Um, and you'll just generally learn it over time, I would say. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's really important that users understand bubbles, not just for building MVPs, you can absolutely scale in bubble. And what I really appreciate is the way that bubble does so much out of the box. As Maria just said, we index databases on your behalf, which I think is super neat. Um, I'm also seeing another question um, from a user about how to iterate and add features to a live app. So once you've deployed an app, what does it look like to then add features on top of that and then to somehow merge changes into the live system? I'll take this one. So version control is a built-in feature that we do offer as part of the bubble ecosystem. And uh, you definitely want to utilize that as much as you possibly can when adding those new features onto your application. It allows you to take essentially a copy of your current live application and continue building those new features on top of that copy test them, make sure you test often, uh, test those new features in that isolated version, verify that everything is working as you would expect it to, and then using that version control feature that we offer, uh, you can then merge those changes up and deploy them to live. So really utilizing that system will uh, give you the superpower to be able to build those new features, test and make sure that they do work in conjunction with your current live state of your application, and then once you verify that everything is good to go, then you can merge those changes up and deploy them to live. Amazing. I couldn't be a bigger fan of version control and love your advice, John, to test early and test often. Um, I'm also seeing a question about how password list login to our users. Is it possible for users to be able to log in with just their email address and then receive some sort of a code to that email and then be able to log in without needing to use a password? I'll take this one too. So we do have a feature for this. Um, it's super powerful, super great, and uh, definitely feel the sentiment of wanting to you know, give the users the ability to uh, log in without a password. And uh, that feature is called Magic Link. And one of us will drop a link into the chat just so that you can uh, hop over to the manual and learn more about that. But essentially what that does is it allows you to uh, have the user type in their email address into an input. And then that magic link will be generated, and you can send that magic link uh, along to that user in an email. There will be a link inside of that email that they can then click on that will direct them to a, a page that you specify in the application, and then the user will be logged in. Amazing. Awesome. Well, we're at time. Maria and John, thank you both for walking us through how to build complex marketplace features and how to use backend workflows for scheduling and canceling emails. Thank you.